Many of us are familiar with the generation and distribution of electric power only by the plug we insert from our appliances in order to use it. Working backwards, the first piece of the puzzle of power distribution that we encounter in everyday life is why plugs have the number of prongs that they have. Some have two and some have three. Let's start by thinking about plugs with two prongs. We can explain that the two prongs of the plugs just by talking about voltage. If you remember that voltage is potential energy, you'll realize that potential only has meaning if you measure it between two things. You need two wires for one to have a potential value relative to the other. Or conversely, we can talk about the two prongs in terms of current, which you can think of as moving electric charges or electrons. Electrons will only move in a current if they have somewhere to go. When electrons moved in the static electricity situation of the Van de Graaff, that was only because of the external force we applied from friction. Electrons will not move as current on their own down a single conductor because there would be no way for them to return. If you think of one prong as current emerging from the grid and one prong as current returning, you'll have an accurate mental model of what's happening. Since we are talking about alternating current, which prong is carrying current in which direction switches 60 times a second. When there's a third prong, that's also known as neutral. It's connected to earth ground, and it's there to be sure that the voltage of the two powered wires doesn't drift. In theory, this can't happen, but in reality, the two wires could accumulate a charge that raises the varying current up by a constant amount. This can represent a danger to certain electrical appliances. The neutral wire is connected into the system to keep unwanted charge from building up. Voltage and current are related. In fact, what we call electric power is voltage multiplied by current. In order to have electric power available to our plugs, we first have to generate it. And our ability to generate electrical energy really means that we convert it from another form of energy. This fact arises from a very important physical law known as conservation of energy. What this law tells us is that energy can neither be created or destroyed, only converted from one form to another. Conservation of energy was proposed in the early 1730s by Emily du Châtelet in France. She was doing research into the nature of heat and light when she realized that different wavelengths of light were associated with differing amounts of energy. This information will be very important to us as it explains why different colors of LED require different amounts of energy. Now, energy conversion is one of the most basic phenomena of electrical engineering. It's surprising how easy it is for me to say the words that describe electrical phenomena, but how incredibly powerful this understanding can be. No pun intended. Electrical energy travels through different media. When we generate and control that energy, we get all of the benefits like communication, entertainment, medical technology, and more. In order for electrical energy to move, it has to either be conducted through some kind of substance that allows its movement, or it has to be radiated through air and space as an electromagnetic wave, like light. In order to understand that energy, engineers have developed ways to model its behavior. We use the models to engineer ways to control energy and make it do what we want it to do. Let's nail that down. What I just said is actually how a shake flashlight works. This is a shake flashlight that I made. The tube is just there to hold the coil of wire. The coil is there to wrap over the changing magnetic field as many times as possible. Where's the magnetic field? Inside the tube is a very strong neodymium magnet.
Magnets create magnetic fields around them naturally. When I shake the tube, it causes the values of the magnetic field at various points in space to change. which gives us an electric field that changes over time, getting stronger and weaker as the magnetic field goes by it. The current can flow along the wire that I wrapped around here, and then that current is flowing through this LED connected to the wire. When we get enough current, the LED lights. It is basically acting as a current detector for us. I can change how fast I shake the magnet through the loop of wire, and you can observe the intensity of the light from the LED. What we just saw was a magnetic field changing in space when the magnet moved up and down. This changing magnetic field caused an electric current in the wire and an electric field that changed over time as the magnet came and went. Next, let's look at what happens when we change a magnetic field in time. This is a small electric motor that might be found in a model airplane or a child's toy. It's essentially a loop of wire surrounding a magnet, and you can see multiple loops of wire surrounding a set of magnets. Here's the outside of a much larger motor taken out of a blender, where you can see the different loops of wire. They will allow us to multiply the output by the number of loops that we have. When I run current through the outside loops of wire by attaching a battery to them, it causes magnetic fields that oppose the magnetic fields inside of the magnet. This pushes on the magnet inside and causes the inner piece or the rotor to turn and we get a motor. If, instead of putting current in and getting motion out, we put motion in by physically turning the motor shaft, we will get current out. I can show you this by attaching a multimeter. A multimeter is a device that measures multiple electric quantities, which might cost you anywhere from $10 to $200. We can attach this multimeter to the tabs where I had put the battery before and use it to measure voltage. The meter reads zero when I first attach it. Then, when I begin turning the shaft myself, you can see a voltage being measured. What you're seeing is energy being converted from the mechanical energy of my hand to electrical energy in the form of current flowing. Now what we have is a generator. So this device is either a motor or a generator. What it shows us is a magnetic field that varies over time. When I rotate the shaft, that gives rise to an electric field that varies over space, which is what we can see as voltage that I measured. When I demonstrated a Van de Graaff generator last time, we saw the effects of charge collecting on the sphere, and then I put some styrofoam on top. What we didn't point out at the time was that the charges were generating an electric field which became strong enough to generate enough force to lift the styrofoam. The intensity of the field decreased as it got farther from the sphere. These three demonstrations illustrate a set of electrical and magnetic phenomena that underline all of electrical engineering. And there's one more idea to highlight. The fourth phenomena has to do with magnetic fields. Now, the easiest way for me to get a magnetic field is to pick up a magnet, which generates a permanent electric field. We can't see the field without help. But 
when I pour iron filings over the magnet, they will line up along the lines of the magnetic field. The lines start on one side of the magnet and end on the other. All magnets behave this way. They all have two poles, which we call north and south. We can't have a particle that has only one pole. They come in pairs. The phenomenon that shows up in these field lines that they both start and end on the magnet shows us a very interesting way that magnetism differs from electricity. It is that magnetic charges, as opposed to electric charges, don't exist. The field lines of an electric field can begin on a single charge and radiate outward, in essence not terminating. Magnetic field lines can't do that. This means the universe is asymmetric and that tends to bother scientists. To an engineer, it means that we cannot build systems that carry magnetic currents in the same way we build systems to carry electric currents. So what's special about this set of four demonstrations? They illustrate four very famous equations now called Maxwell's equations. Yes, equations. The tool that we use to model the behavior of electromagnetic energy is mathematical equations. One of the things that puts some people off about engineering in general and electrical engineering specifically is our tendency to speak in math. And when I say speak in math, I really mean it. Mathematics is a language, very much like any other. The most important thing to realize about it is that just like a native English speaker has to learn Spanish, we all have to learn to speak math at some point in our lives. So let's speak through the demonstrations again. And notice this time that Maxwell's four equations are actually two pairs. The first pair about fields and the second pair about charges. First, the shake flashlight told us that a magnetic field changing over space yields an electric field that changes over time plus some electric current. This part of the equation that has the upside down delta stands for the magnetic field varying in all three dimensions of space. The part that stands for the electric field varying only in time is written by del dt. To understand something varying in time, but not in space, imagine a time-lapse video showing a seed sprouting, growing, and getting leaves. It's varying in time, but not in space because it isn't traveling. By contrast, something varying in space, but not time, is like taking a picture of a field of sunflowers. They won't all be blooming the same amount. They will vary over the space of the field, but they won't vary in time because the picture is a snapshot of a moment in time. Second, the generator demo showed that a magnetic field changing over time produces an electric field that changes over space. This is something that Michael Faraday first noticed in 1831. Third, the Van de Graaff generator demonstrated that electric charges give rise to an electric field that varies over space. The field is strongest near the electric charge and gets weaker as the distance increases. Each charge creates an electric field. Because the charges are the same polarity, the fields oppose each other, which causes a force to be generated between them. That force is what causes the styrofoam blocks to move. Finally, our examination 
of the magnet's field leads to the fourth idea that there is no such thing as a magnetic charge. When electrons carry electric charge, no one has ever found anything that carries magnetic charge. So the outcome of all this is that changing electric fields cause changing magnetic fields, and changing magnetic fields cause electric fields and current. And the reverse is also true. Changing current causes magnetic fields. That's how we make the shake flashlight. The lack of magnetic charges and thus the lack of magnetic current is the only thing that keeps this phenomena from being completely mirrored. This duality of Maxwell's equations is pretty neat. I mean, one of the things they predict is that a motor can be a generator and vice versa. Generators are what is used to convert energy from other forms into electrical energy. They're how we get the electric current that's distributed all over the electric grid. Most generators require some kind of force to turn the shaft, just as I did with my fingers. Then the turbines can be turned by steam created from heat. Now that heat can come from many different sources, usually by burning them. Alternatively, the turbines can be turned by wind or water. This is a generator that was used in an early power plant at Niagara Falls. Many early generators used coal, and many still do. Coal is burned to heat, water, and creates steam. That steam turns the turbine, which is connected to the shaft of the generator. The electricity generated is then conveyed over power lines to end users. In 2019, the U.S. still used coal for about 23% of electricity production, while China used coal for 58% of electricity production. Natural gas was the largest source of heat energy for making steam in U.S. electricity production in 2019 at 38% of all sources. Nuclear was the third most common source of electrical energy in 2019, all of it nuclear fission. Fission separates atoms into less complex particles and releases nuclear energy in the process. We use that nuclear energy to convert hot water into steam and to create the mechanical energy that turns a turbine and the generator shaft to create electrical energy. There's also hope for nuclear energy by fusion, which forces simple atoms together into larger atoms and also releases energy to create heat to create steam. This is one of the National Academy of Engineering's grand challenges for the 21st century. But with solar energy, it's possible to create electrical energy directly without needing to turn a turbine and generator as an intermediary. This is an example of a photovoltaic or PV solar cell made out of silicon. PV cells make use of a physical phenomenon called the photovoltaic effect. When the photons of light strike certain types of materials, the hold of these materials on their electrons is loosened, and then the electrons can be made to move and become part of an electric current. Most solar cells are still made from silicon, but the materials that make good solar cells are very much under research. Researchers are looking at ways to make cells flexible, robust, and cheap because these cells are very stiff and can break easily. A cell like this one is combined with many others into solar panels so that the currents can get added up into larger and useful amounts of current. The resulting current can be used to power devices directly or it can be incorporated as a source of electricity onto the electric grid. This can also be done in different ways. The electricity could be used to drive a motor, which is attached to a generator. Alternatively, the solar energy can be used to heat water and drive a turbine. I think you're getting the point, right? So why the need for intermediate steps? Why can't electricity from solar energy be added directly onto the grid? 
Well, it's because the electricity produced by solar cells travels in one direction only. It's direct current, or DC. Remember how Edison, Westinghouse, and Tesla argued about DC versus AC? Our electric grid supplies the alternating current of AC. Electricity generated from solar cells has to be converted from DC to AC. Individual homes that are off the grid could use DC entirely, but most homes that have solar panels on the roof usually have a device called an inverter that converts DC to AC. Inverters can range from watts to megawatts, and their physical size is decreasing rapidly as we start using new materials like silicon carbide. Now let me show you a few things with this solar cell that I have here. I'm gonna attach a multimeter to the cell and it will show the voltage that we get as I shine various colors of light on it. I'm measuring voltage, which as we saw before is directly related to power and energy. The higher the voltage, the higher the energy output. What you see now is just ambient light from the studio. If I cover the cell, we can see the voltage output drop. White light contains different proportions of various light colors depending on its source. Sunlight brings a nearly even distribution across the visible frequencies. It also has a fair amount of radiation at both the shorter wavelengths of ultraviolet and the longer wavelengths of infrared. The glass that covers most solar cells actually blocks ultraviolet radiation. This cell doesn't have glass, so we should be able to see if ultraviolet will generate electricity. Now, let's see if the response changes when I add glass. Now I'll use filters to expose the cell to one color of light at a time. I'm going to start with the red filter, which will filter out all but the red light. Then a green filter to take out all but the green light. Then a blue filter to take out all but the blue energy. Now if I put all three filters together, the result should be pretty near zero because white light is composed of all the colors. Finally, let's look again at this ultraviolet flashlight. This is long wave ultraviolet, sometimes known as black light and it's the least dangerous form of ultraviolet. We can see this picks up ultraviolet A very well. UVB is more energetic, but a lot of UVB is blocked by the Earth's atmosphere. UVC is the most dangerous to life, which is why germicidal lamps are made with UVC but UVC is entirely blocked by the Earth's atmosphere, so solar cells on Earth can ignore it. Of course, human-made light sources do not come anywhere near sunlight in the energies they offer across different frequencies. Solar cells made of different materials differ in their ability to convert various frequencies of sunlight. In fact, one reason you might prefer a specific solar cell over another is its ability to use a wider range of frequencies of light. Indeed, one of the ways that solar cells are inefficient is in whether they're able to convert light to electricity across the entire available spectrum of their light sources. In the year 2020, even the most efficient solar cells were only about 20% efficient. This is another reason that researchers are looking at how to make solar cells from different types of materials. 
Even studying the natural process of photosynthesis used by leaves to convert solar energy to other types of energy. Engineers have already developed a huge variety of ways to generate electricity, and you can expect more in the future. What is important to remember is that the results of these efforts is the same as far as the electricity is concerned. They create a flow of electrical current that then has to be distributed to the people that need to use it. But how does the electrical energy get from generators to my house? In the next lesson, we'll learn about the electric grid, its origins, and how the new smart grid will carry us into the future.